Psalm 19. And uh, let's read verse 7. Let's go all the way through 11 again. Verse 7 says, The law of Yahweh is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. And, you know, you could focus on the first half of those passages. You know, the law of Yahweh is perfect. The, the testimony of Yahweh is sure. The statutes of Yahweh are right. Or you can focus on the second half of it. And we need to as well, where it says the law of Yahweh is perfect, restoring the soul. Boy, there's so much in each half of every one of those cases, um, in those uh, seven or nine statements therein. And then it goes on to say in verses 10 and 11, it says, More to be desired are they than gold. The average man, oh, he's, especially at the prices they are today, <laughs> he's interested in gold. Not this preacher. I'm, I'm interested in something that's worth far, far more than gold, and I know you are as well. Moreover, by them, or excuse me, more to be desired than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. And then he ends by saying, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. What a great reward God has in not only knowing, and especially in knowing our Lord and Savior and and the redeeming act performed for us in his resurrection from the grave, but also in and through him, knowing and understanding and applying his laws to our lives. What a great reward he has given us therein. I entitled the previous message, The Preamble, A New National God, which is precisely what the framers did with the first three words alone, we the people. That this, in, that this is, in fact, true is not only self-apparent in the preamble itself, but as I think I mentioned in the last message as well, it is established and demonstrated in several ways throughout the entire Constitution and its amendments. And nothing probably demonstrates um, that demonstrates we the people as this new national God since 1788 better, I, in my opinion, better than Article 6 of the original Constitution. Now, in order for what to many, I'm sure, will seem many, most, um, by far, the vast majority of not only secular, the secular United States of America, but even Christian America, in order for what to many will seem like an outlandish, I'm sure, claim to be true, that is that we the people actually is America's national God, I must also be able to demonstrate that the Philadelphia framers also established a new national law for its new national God. One of the principal means by which something is demonstrated as a god is by a law which is inherent or unique to that god. That, more than anything else, I think, is what demonstrates something to be a god, that it has to itself a unique law. Whether we're talking about Baal, whether we're talking about Asherah, Moloch, or Buddha, or Krishna, or Brahman, or we the people. The most distinguishing mark of those gods um, is the law, or is a law that is unique to that god. It, what, it's what distinguish them, distinguishes them from all other gods. It is consequently incumbent upon me to not only identify the new god, but also the new god's new law. So, I ask you, did the framers establish a new law? A law that, in fact, replaced Yahweh's law as found previously in most of the 17th century colonies. Well, this is precisely what the framers accomplished with Article 6. Article 6, Section 1, Clause 2. 
quote, this Constitution and the laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. Not just any law, but the supreme law of the land. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, as would be expected. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. End of that quote. You know, although there, there is much about the framers that is unknown and still up for debate, um, in fact, perhaps these men, there's, there's so much, I think, about these men that um, is still not understood and known. But one thing I, don't, I think that no one will debate about these men, and that is that the framers were not dummies. They were extremely intelligent men. And when they pinned the word supreme in the Constitution being the supreme law of the land, they, I assure you, were fully cognizant of its meaning and its implications. In fact, they sealed its meaning so that there is no ambiguity whatsoever in what they meant by the word. Listen to it again. It begins by saying, the, this Constitution, what Constitution? Well, not the Constitution. We know, we know what the Constitution of Yahweh is. Not the Constitution of Yahweh. That should be immediately apparent that it, it couldn't have been the Constitution as it was described by in, um, in the 1600 colonies. Not the Constitution of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, but the Constitution, nobody should argue, of we the people. That's who, the, that's who they're talking about. With that in mind, it, it says, Article 6, this Constitution, this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land. And the judges, here's, here's their sealing it, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything, anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. In other words, constitutional republic judges and, of course, presidents and quote-unquote legislators um, as well are bound to the federal constitution as the supreme law of the land. Above, above anything in any state constitution or law that is contrary to the federal constitution. Now, although not specifically stated, it is inherent, nonetheless, in the word supreme. Supreme is supreme. And so it is inherent in the word supreme that the same is true for any constitution. You think that that does, wouldn't apply to the constitution of, of the USSR, that this constitution is the supreme law of the land over the constitution of the USSR? USSR's constitution or any other country's or nation's constitution. And so it's inherent in the word supreme, although the, not specifically stated, that the same is true for any constitution or laws, including the perfect law of Yahweh found in his constitution. The fact is, when the framers declared the United States Constitution the supreme law of the land, they governmentally made the laws of Yahweh subservient to the laws of we the people. And, you know, think about it. For the most part, haven't um, they been exactly that since 1788? Except, you know, they don't mind if you apply his laws within the four walls of your church building or within your own life. But from a governmental standpoint, have not the laws of Yahweh since 1788 been subservient to what the Constitution describes as the supreme law of the land. Well, of course they have been, because Yahweh's law is no longer the supreme law of the land as it had been in the 1600s. Something else has replaced it. And therefore, it has, since, since the states ratified the Constitution and allowed for that, of course Yahweh's laws are subservient to that, and that's what we see today more and more as time goes on. It's inevitable 
that Yahweh's laws are incompatible with the United States Constitution. Now, with this being true, that is that Article 6 established we the people's law a law that is opposite, contrary, and inconsistent with Yahweh's law, and which therefore, according to Article 6 and the Supreme Court cases enforcing it, makes Yahweh's law null and void. The two, again, are clearly incompatible, and according to Marbury versus Madison, Yahweh's law in its effect in a governmental and national sense is null and void. A new law has replaced it. At least for all practical purposes, um, it has done so and also thereby, um, if you think about it, also has made Yahweh himself Government, at least in theory, um, well, in practicality as well, because we are under a new law, but has made Yahweh himself, therefore, governmentally impotent. It is, therefore, inescapable that this new supreme national law established we the people as America's new national God. And are you beginning, if you haven't already, are you beginning to see why I identify, therefore, the Constitution as our nation's national idol? We've got lots of other idols, but there is one major idol in this country, and it is unquestionably our national idol as, as Americans, hopefully not for these Americans, but for the vast majority of Americans, their national idol is the United States Constitution. And why... It, and, and also, hopefully you're seeing why, if ever we hope to return America to her Christian roots, um, those as found in the 1600s, not the 1700s, everybody wants to point people back to the 1700s. <laughs> no, if we're going to point people back somewhere, we need to be pointing them back to the 1600s. Did, did America have Christian roots? You bet she did. But they were lost in the 1700s. We've got to quit pointing people back to where they were lost and point them back to what was lost. And that was their Christian roots found in the early 1600 American colonies. Why, if we ever hope to return America to her Christian roots, again, the secular, humanistic, united constitution is the paramount issue facing Christian Americans. Like I mentioned, I think, last night, hack away at the branches of the corrupt tree every chance you get, whether it be infanticide, whether it be uh, sodomy or whatever it is. If they're in front of you, hack away at them. But <laughs> hacking away at the branches isn't going to bring down the tree. We've got to cut this thing off at its roots, and therefore the Constitution, the national idol, becomes the paramount issue for us in America as it concerns bringing back America from the depths of wickedness that she is finding herself and falling even deeper into. Um, we must not only engage this battle. Right now, I'll be satisfied in getting a whole lot more engaged like you folks in the battle. But that we've got to do more than just engage this battle. We've got to one day win this battle for our God and for our posterity. Yeah.